Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Bruce Wilkinson, President and CEO of what is now called the Catholic Medical Mission Board, but the organization is going through a rebranding and that is currently in process. We'll talk about that in a moment. The Catholic Medical Mission Board is an international faith-based NGO and for over a century the organization has provided long-term cooperative medical and developmental aid to communities affected by poverty and unequal access to health care. Bruce has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Bruce, for joining us today. Thank you, Mark. Good to be here. So the organization has a 100-year history. It is a it, it has made so many different contributions to the world. Talk about that history. Talk about its genesis and talk about where the, the organization is now. Well, it is a fairly unique organization being in global health for 102 years, actually originating out of New York from St. Vincent's Hospital, of course, which does not exist anymore, but I want right. to salute the people of St. Vincent's for their care of those who are suffering from HIV, and I know that they did an amazing job um, during the t years that were very, very troubling here in New York. So it really is a, an honor to have St. Vincent's in our, in our history. It actually comes out of a Jesuit tradition, uh, or as in the Catholic world, they call that a Jesuit charism. It's really more about a can-do attitude of people who get their hands dirty, get out and make things happen in this world, and of course our Pope Francis is leading by example these days. It's a wonderful example to see that uh, the church refocusing on issues of poverty and issues of helping those who are marginalized. So CMB comes out of that history. We actually were started in 1912 um, by a medical doctor, an anesthesiologist here in New York who lost his wife and child at birth. And he was significantly, of course, impacted by that. And he said, you know, I just need to go and find my own healing, yet I want to bring healing to others. And so he engaged colleagues out of St. Vincent's and in the greater New York area, and then started traveling to the Caribbean during the years of sort of 1912 to 1920. And from that, CMB has emerged as a leader in global health, a faith-based leader in global health. And we've stayed focused on those issues throughout our history. We've had um, amazing times. The, the Jesuits were very clever in 1930, bought a, two brownstones on 17th Street um, here in Brooklyn, and um, oh, sorry, here in Manhattan. And that was just a beautiful um, sort of legacy they have left. We're still in those buildings on 17th Street. Um, and uh, we are literally at a place now where we're looking at what, is, what do we need to do to refresh the organization. Uh, actually, uh, for, after 100 years, I thought, well, we might want to call ourselves uh, an organization that has a great history. Yet at the same time, we're actually calling ourselves a 102-year-old startup. And to come into our, our offices these days looks very different from what you'd have seen probably 20 years ago. So let's talk a bit about the span of the impact that you've had worldwide. And then let's go back and let's talk about how do you rebrand a 102-year-old startup? We serve people around the world, of course. Um, and we've actually, um, we shipped pharmaceutical supplies and medical supplies to over 65 countries, um, anywhere between 300 and 500 million dollars worth of pharmaceuticals and medical supplies every year. 300 and 500 million to 65 countries, and those countries are generally um, uh, countries where uh, populations live in distress. That's right. These would be low-income countries where people don't have the ability to pay for the medicines and the medical supplies that they receive. So we work with a lot of different partners helping those who don't have access to have access to the medicines they need and to the medical supplies. And the continents need. are? The continents are Africa, the continents are Latin America, Caribbean, Asia. Um, we primarily focus on Latin America, Caribbean, and Africa in terms of most of our work. We've had a rich tradition actually in Asia. That seems to be Asia doing um, better these days in terms of having less countries and less folks in need. Uh, we've actually focused on uh, the Caribbean and Africa. And how do these medical supplies and, and other services reach the individuals that, uh, that you serve? Well, we actually have one of, the, one of the fastest moving and efficient supply chains in the world. We get many of these supplies actually which are, are somewhat short dated. In other words, they need mm -hmm. to get into the bloodstream as fast as they can. So CMB pride, prides itself on moving these supplies very quickly around the world. So we actually have a, have a warehouse in Queens in Long Island City. Um, that was another one of these beautiful situations where in 1962, uh, you know, some had foresight. And then also we distribute through other partners um, in the U.S., but all of our work goes overseas. All of it is a global. We actually have been very, very, very 
we take a deep breath whether we should do more domestic work, yet we find that our probably our, our real comparative advantage is, is in the global scene. So in many respects, you're, you are not only a charitable organization, you're also a logistics organization, you're also a medical organization. You have to develop some pretty sophisticated agreements with your partners because you not only are distributing yourselves, but you also are uh, developing dropship where, where um, organizations might ship directly uh, to their destination. So you, you have a very, very complicated set of business competencies that need to be incorporated into the organization itself. It's true. We actually meld in really three main aspects. One is that medical supplies and pharmaceuticals. The other is we actually work with a lot of volunteers. And these would be people that come from the corporate sector, come from the private sector, people who want to go out and make a difference and build capacity in the countries where we work. So we have clinicians coming to us, medical doctors, gynecologists. We have a whole array of clinicians. Then we also have people who have very good business backgrounds, mm -hmm. people who are experienced in supply chain and in, in logistics. Um, they're experienced in, in IT. They're experienced in hospital administration because, again, our focus, of course, is working and strengthening hospital systems around the world. So that's our third component. We actually work within this um, environment what we'll uh, partner with hospital systems in developing world countries and these are existing hospital systems where we'll build their capacity around women and children's health. So we actually have people who are in country working with these hospital systems to strengthen the work they do with women and children. And then bringing those teams to the point of service and having those teams coordinated and be balanced is also a, a part of, of your work. Absolutely, and uh, the work ranges from issues like HIV and AIDS to malaria to TB. We also are now focusing on many of the chronic issues around women's health. We know that um, healthy grandmoms, we say, are a sign of a healthy society. So um, when you know that grandmoms are, have their function in society, we all know that we've grown up with grandmoms who've helped to shape us in ways in our lives. They're a beautiful result of, um, of a society that is well. And so what we try to do is we try to work in that space of women's health as well as children's health because we believe those are two areas that anytime you have a society where children are well and the women are treated fairly and equitably, you usually have a very, very functioning society and one that has very good health indicators. Are your essential relationships with the healthcare providers within the organizations, with their governments, or is it a combination? It is a combination. We work with many stakeholders. Um, so we work with the governments, of course. We work with existing hospital systems, which are usually under the ministries of health within mm -hmm. those countries. We work with a lot of corporate partners within those same foundations. And we also, the, the real aspect is we join up between what I would call the clinical and the community. We have this amazing capacity to have clinical strength as well as the community strength. We know how to approach communities and then to marry the two. Because many times in the developing world, I've spent 30 years in Africa, um, you'll find that there is a bit of a disconnect between the clinical work that can take place and then how that translates into the community. Right. So many times it's really making sure healthy practices are going on in the community and they're matched up with the clinical services that can be provided. How do you assure that the, um, the supplies, the services and so on and so forth actually get out to the people according to need as opposed to according to uh, some table tilting um, uh, agenda? that, that uh, might um, uh, be, uh, that, that, that some players might have? Well, that's where the 102 year history comes in. We've learned how to get to those who really need the help. We go to the really remote places. I just came back from Western Equatoria in South Sudan. I was just in a clinic there where we've been working with them now for the last five years. It's called Safe Motherhood. And we just celebrated with the community, and this is an amazing statistic, the 1,500th birth without loss of life to child or mom. 1,500 without loss of, of life? life to child or mom. And this is in South Sudan, which has the highest maternal mortality rate in the world. And part of the success in, in, in Western Equatoria, South Sudan, was the trained community workers that have been being trained over the last five years. They do amazing work identifying those women who actually are pregnant and bringing them through a whole series of uh, tests and activities that really lead to a safe delivery. And then we also follow up. We really believe the first thousand days for children are so important. So again, the children getting their vaccinations, children finding their way to a better and healthy life. And so you have this, the, the, these series of programs. It's, it's, it's so interesting. You're, you're strengthening the health care but you're strengthening healthcare with particular outcomes in sight. Absolutely, uh, Mike, you 
be, you'd, be, you'd be very interested. Just take a look at our strategy and then our balanced scorecard, which reflects that. So we actually begin with the premise of a collective impact. We say that as an organization, we need to draw partners together to achieve reductions in maternal mortality and infant mortality. So those are the, out, the outcomes. Those, those are where you want your, to move the needle on your balanced scorecard. That's exactly right. So they're right at the top of that. So in other words, we are all about achieving those results. And then we build out our approaches and programs and better practice, the type of partners that we should involve. That's why we've chosen existing health system moves within the developing world countries, because they have a rich history. They have 50, 100 years of service. They know a lot about the, the context. There are times when I walk in, especially some of the faith-based ones, and either you have the sisters or the, or the missionaries that have been around those places or the, you know, the, the nationals who really have a deep, deep experience. And you come in and tell them what you think they should do. <laughs> and they'll sort you out in a hurry. And it is a brilliant partnership which evolves at that point. And then we basically almost create what I call open system software. We, we actually start inviting people in to add value where they know they can add value. So if it's a university, they can come in here. If it's a corporate, they can come in here. If it's a local partner, they can come in. I was just in, I was just in Kenya with Bob Collymore of this huge cell service provider, right? I mean, huge. And they are absolutely interested in partnering with us because M Health is, a, is is something that's transforming women having access to information which comes in on their cell phones when they become pregnant. They then can go through a series, and it, it just makes our world so much smaller and tighter. And the results now feed back up into those frameworks. And if we can show folks results, the rest of the story takes care of itself. Everybody wants to see a difference. We want what did you do that actually made a difference in people's lives? And that's what we can show. So how do you get to this point? You started off in the Peace Corps. And, and, and now you're, you're running this, this global organization with a mission of peace, of mutual support, with, with partnership. How do you evolve a career to the point where you are uh, pr the, the, the chief executive officer of such a complex organization? The Peace Corps did a wonderful thing. They brought me in and they put me with a Ghanaian family. I went to Ghana as a Peace Corps volunteer. I was a 22-year-old, one month out of college, and never traveled in the developing world at that point. You had never, uh, you had never traveled in the developing world, never so that, that was an interesting experience. And immediately, they had the foresight to put me with a Ghanaian family for three weeks before they did our training. And the reason they put us with a Ghanaian family who kind of adopted you and put you in the family, you just lived with the family, was to show you how much you really did not know about the culture, how much you didn't know about how, getting, how, how to get things changed within those. We go with these marvelous ambitions, right? We're all, we're all ambitious at those, those, those years and probably a little bit, let's just say we're not as Hubristic. Wise. Yeah. <laughs> So, so you come in, um, sort of the, the invulnerable, immortal, all-knowing 22-year-old. Um, you then have your comeuppance, understanding that, wow, there's a lot here that, that uh, I don't know. And then you serve in the Peace Corps for your, for your years. What was that like? It was great. I actually worked in an agricultural development bank, uh, helping farmers to expand their farm sizes and giving them seed and inputs, um, fertilizers to help them move that along. And so that was a great program. What was interesting more so was what Peace Corps, you know, many times you'll say you receive much more than, right, than you can give. And that was true in my experience in the Peace Corps. And when I walked away from that experience, I just knew how much a little could accomplish in a context to improve the well-being of others. And that's when I came back, I, I got married, I said to my wife, I said, we've got to go and, and do a couple of years of service somewhere, just before we plug into mainstream America, right? right. And sure enough, we went out and did two years. Um, and Where'd you go? We went back to Ghana, actually. It was very interesting. We had three choices. We ended up going to Ghana, to the north of Ghana, and I helped in this group that actually did linguistic research and then actually developed oral languages into written languages and then gave them back um, all materials in their own language. So taught them to read in, in their, their national languages, and then actually did a lot of the development materials in agriculture and health and education in those materials. Very interesting. At that time, we actually lost our, um, our, our child during that time, right at the end of that. And all of a sudden, here was this sort of big momentum. We're going to do a kind of a career overseas a bit. And all of a sudden, we hit this place. And I think it was that moment that we reflect on now, which I wish we could have had that deeper reflection at the time, but we reflect on now. That's probably one of the motivations that put us in this global health environment and serving overseas for the last uh, 35 years. Um, 
it really helped us to identify with the pain and the loss that um, women in those contexts would go through. And so we had a personal um, place of identification with that. So much of your work revolves children and mothers, and you have this partnership, uh, that, that uh, program that you've evolved over the years. Could you talk about the Children and Mothers Partnership? So CHAMPS uh, stands for Children and Mothers Partnerships, and this is what we do. We, we actually partner with existing hospital systems, and we have this transcendent idea of improving maternal and child health. And who wouldn't want to improve maternal and child health, right? Okay, so we then invite partners again into this, and we actually partner with those hospital systems and the community. And what we want to do is we want to partner with them for 15 to 20 years. We know if you're going to do what we call, in our language, health system strengthening, uh, we saw in Ebola, we know that the health systems in those countries really were not capable of dealing with those infectious diseases. We want to strengthen the health systems, not only for women and children's health, but also for other issues that they're facing in their society, right? And so this is a 15 to 20 year partnership and we invite partners from all walks, corporates, we've got foundations, we've got individuals, we've got the ministries of health. We bring those folks together at a community level, which usually covers around 60 to 100,000 catchment area of people, so 60 to 100,000 people. And then we start working on economic development from the households because if people don't have the means, they're not gonna be able to afford right. healthcare. Then we work on issues of sanitation and water huge issues in terms of impact on health. We then work on, if you would like, mom safe delivery. We work on children vaccination coverage as we make sure nutrition in the children is actually up to par. So all of a sudden you start to build a movement within that society and when people start to see the results, so again it goes back to the results framework we're talking about. When they see the results in their own community, they themselves start to adopt these health seeking behaviors and it then starts to spiral up. So all of a sudden you get this huge momentum and belief in the society that change is possible. And when we believe change is possible, you know the only limit on that is it's the belief that that change is going to be positive. So all of a sudden we'll set a threshold that we can't go above. No, that's not true. Those societies then find themselves in a place where their own thinking says, we could actually have 1,500 births without a death to mom and child. When they start to believe that and put those into practice and actually have the health seeking behaviors, you see radical transformation. One of the things that is so fascinating, when you take a look at somebody who has been so deeply involved in direct services and then eventually coming back and, and dealing in that uh, uncivilized Washington world of, of advocacy and trying to actually get people to cooperate on a piece of legislation or a piece of advocacy that, that is so important, is to see that sensibility then translate into something as esoteric and uh, sterile as as the question of what a brand means and the importance of branding. You're involved in a rebranding effort for the organization. Why is branding so important to somebody who has such a deep experience in direct services? Uh, brand is everything in terms of it, it reflects your core identity and so when you're very sure on your core identity we've gone through a very very deep process in terms of making sure our vision mission and values are absolutely firmly rooted where we've come out of in this beautiful history of this organization so we've gone through a very deep exercise of making sure we're aligned with that original vision vision mission and values and then we of course in the branding world they want you to develop a position statement or a brand brief right, right? and and basically really says what are the words you're going to use to talk about your organ how do you communicate to others and to get them engaged because we believe we can provide deep meaning for people's lives when they get engaged with us they can actually get engaged see the results and they themselves feel fulfilled because they know they're helping others so it's the ability to communicate that brand through an engagement model that leads to deeper meaning we're currently right in the process of actually even considering should we keep the same name because the branding agency has helped us to show us that our name is a bit long, it is a bit dated. Therefore, how do we make that name serve us in the next century of our service? Well, Bruce Wilkinson, thank you so much for sharing the experience of the Catholic Medical Mission Board. We'll be watching how your branding goes, how your rebranding goes, and thank you so much for your insight. Thank you. Thank you very much.